So, uh, we've been doing a lot of different, uh, different teachings and things over the last uh, few weeks. We uh, have had a lot of fun. Um, we're going to start a kind of a new series tonight that uh, we'll see how far it continues on. Sometimes uh, ideas keep coming and these series continue on, and sometimes it's just time to, to, to be done. <laughs> so, um, but we're going to be uh, talking about some uh, ways to uh, put uh, into action in our marriages, the things that we talk a lot about in here. So we're going to talk about some very practical things. Um, you don't have to flip to this verse, but uh, 1 John uh, 3.18 talks about, uh, it says, little children or dear children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And in James 1.22, a verse that we hear uh, often, be doers of the word and not hearers only. So let's take what we learn and what God teaches us about marriage and about being a Christ follower and put it into action. We can sit here and we can come in on Sundays and we can have Bible studies and do devotions and we can read all these great things, but if we don't do it, then it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have a lot of fruit. It doesn't bear a lot of fruit in our life. So we want to put these things into action. So that's kind of what we're going to be, what are, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, tonight specifically we're going to be talking about how our words, uh, what the power that our words have, how we should use those in our, uh, in our marriages and in life in general, uh, how our speech and the things that we say, the power that that has. Um, and so we want to apply that. So it's kind of, it almost sounds contradictory to the, the verse that we read because the verse says, um, you know, let us not love in word or talk, but indeed and in truth, uh, that saying, you know, let's just not be merely talkers but, and, and hearers of the word, but do it. Um, but our speech and how we speak, as we'll learn tonight, is, is an action. And it, and it does cause actions, and it has a lot of repercussions with the things that we say and how we talk, especially when it comes to how we resolve conflict in our marriages, the, the, the things that can be said. Um, man, we can, we can do great things with the words that we speak to one another, or we can tear things apart. And so uh, we want to look at that. Um, so uh, we want to uh, uh, learn how to put these things in action. So tonight we're going to talk about how we speak, how we speak. So we'll start off in the book of James. Uh, James, actually, James chapter 3. We'll read a few verses here. Uh, James, the, being the, the most likely the, uh, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, speaking here, this is known as kind of like a, the, the Proverbs of the New Testament. It's a, it's a wisdom book, uh, so there's tons of, of great uh, practical wisdom in the book of James, and so we're going to look to that. He has some very pointed things to say about how we say things, all right? So James 3, uh, we'll read all these verses. We'll talk a little about it. James 3, verse 2. Excuse me. See? I'm, I'm falling apart again. James 3, verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so." Does a spring pour forth from the, same open, uh, from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. It's got a lot of strong things to say 
about the tongue, about our mouth, about how this thing that, that is this little part of our body can cause and really drives, uh, can drive our whole life. It can tear it down. It can build it up. It has extreme power. It uses the example of a horse, right? So you put a, a bit. Horses are one of the, one of the largest land animals uh, that there is, right? They're huge animals. We used to have a couple horses, you know, they over 1,000 pounds. They're just, they're just huge animals. They could just stomp you right over if they wanted to. But you, with a little bit of training and a bridle, a bit in that horse's mouth, you know, a 60-pound little girl could sit on that horse and drive that thing around by this bit in its mouth. The same thing in this example of, of how our mouth can control our life uh, in our marriages. Uh, same thing used in a ship. Every ship, modern or old, you know, there's huge wooden ships, sailboats, whatever it is, you know, or modern cruise ships or anything like that. There, some, somewhere on that ship is a rudder. And proportionate to that ship, it is a tiny little thing that sits in the water, usually behind the propellers or whatever, and, it, and all it has to do is the captain moves the steering wheel and it changes the direction of that little rudder and that whole entire ship, no matter how big it is, is going to turn. This is how James is using our, uh, to describe what our mouth is. Such a small part of the body yet wields such great power. This is a, the, the example he uses of a fire. This is, a, we, we use this terminology all the time. We can literally set our life ablaze by saying some really hurtful things to one another. Uh, a small fire can spread and burn down the greatest of forests. Our words have an enormous effect on our life. The things that we say, the words that come out of our mouth. Human beings are created in the image of God and we're created unique to all the other parts, all the other things in creation, we have this ability to speak. Now, there are certain exceptions, a parrot, I suppose, or something like that. You know, I guess you could call that some kind of speech, and animals may have their own kind of language of some sort. But we are certainly set apart that God has created us in his image and created us to use words. Uh, God created the very earth that we are on with words. The power of his word was what created, what caused this thing to be created, the, 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 the world around us, the universe. Um, his word is, it has power to it as well. And, and all these things we think about, but then we toss around words and we toss around language like it's not doesn't mean anything. We say things to one another when we're angry, when we're upset, as if it's okay. We say things that will, uh, might be negative, using negative words towards one another that can hurt each other, that can hurt people around us. We, we, our emotions, our inside emotions that comes out through words usually first. Sometimes uh, men and women might be different in this regard. Sometimes in men it comes out with their fists first, but generally there's some words spoken. Uh, Words can be very powerful. Words lead to action also. Our mouth is something that makes us all equal, okay? The, the smallest uh, little person to the largest big person, uh, strongest, weakest, doesn't matter. They all have the ability to say words and, and, and tear something down or build something up with the language of the words that they use to speak to one another, it's powerful. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how big you are, how strong you are. It doesn't matter what you know. Your words are just as powerful and just as meaningful to somebody else around you as anyone else's. There are, I didn't count all of them, but during research, you know, looking through this and studying through this, there are, I'm going to go ahead and say, uh, probably hundreds of verses throughout the Bible related to how we speak how we should speak, how we shouldn't speak, and how people spoke and it caused problems or did good things. And so we're going to dig into a little bit of that tonight. And the point of this is for us to realize how important it is that we talk and we, we look to, to God and, and the Spirit of God to, to uh, outflow out of this little member of our body the love that God offers us when we're talking to our husbands and talking to our wives and talking to other people as well. So we're going to talk about a couple of those things. We all have a struggle with this. So the most gentle spirit person in the world, the, you know, or the, the harshest, most angry person in the world, like we all struggle with this in different ways, okay? 
It says that because it says in the beginning of those verses, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. We know this is not possible, but he's saying like, if anybody could control their mouth, you'd be perfect. Like everything else comes easy. This is the hardest thing to do. It's the easiest thing to let our emotions come right out in words towards each other. And that verse that Tom read earlier, it can cut like a knife or it can be healing. It just depends on the words we use. Words have power. God is warning us that this is true. And we should pay attention to it. So let's flip back to Proverbs 18. We're going to actually look at a few Proverbs. So we'll be kind of bouncing back to the the older wisdom books, I guess. Uh, Proverbs has a ton of things, and so does Psalms, to say about uh, our speech and how we talk. Proverbs probably has the most, I would say. Uh, Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. I'm going to focus on the first part of this verse mainly. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. To further prove this point, that your words and the words spoken in our marriages and in the world, they have, they literally, uh, they, they lead to action, right? They're not just words. Sometimes we talk about empty talk and all these things, but words lead to action. They have the power over life and death. They have the power over a lot more than you think. Think of, of all the ways that words are spoken. Words can be used in great ways. Um, I think of an example I, I found, uh, uh, somebody warning uh, someone of danger. Uh, I can say, there's a tornado coming in your area, take shelter. Those words are spoken. Somebody does something and their life is saved or whatever. A surgeon or a doctor uh, makes the right recommendation. Hey, you have this sickness, you have this thing, you need to do this, this, and this, and you will get better. He says these things, they're put into action, things happen, life you know, is, is, uh, is uh, improved, or life is saved, and other things like that. Uh, somebody, a counselor, sitting with somebody who is, is struggling with suicidal thoughts, or struggling with life, or other things like that, the counselor will sit there, and they will tell them positive things, focus on these things, they will give them a course of action that would sa- could save their life or change the course of their, uh, um, the word of God, all the things that we read and encourage us, these things have a positive effect on our life. They, they, they have action. They lead to action in our life. Um, judges, a judge issues a verdict. Guilty, not guilty. There's an action that takes place. He speaks the words, something then happens. This, you know, the words we speak, they, they have great power over life and death. And this is the point is, is that they have great power over uh, our marriages. It may not be life and death in our marriage, okay? It could be, but it might not be. It might just be the very health of our marriage that's at stake. If we're constantly tearing each other down, if we are constantly each other's worst enemies and not being on the same team, the very health of our marriage is at stake. If we are building each other up and being, you know, we we talk about like being each other's cheerleader Uh, being the person that we come to for encouragement. If we're using positive, encouraging words with each other, it can change the course of your marriage. It can change the course of everything you do that day. We'll talk a bit more about that as well in a minute. A couple chapters back in Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15, 4. There are two main things that are going to happen. I've already said this a bunch of times. I'll say it one more. There are positive words. There are negative words. There are ways that we can speak to one another that are either going to be uplifting or not. And here's the distinction. A gentle tongue or gentle words, okay, is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit Gentle tongue is a tree of life. Think of the Garden of Eden. Think of Adam and Eve sitting in the garden, God literally dwelling with them. This this great picture of health and and spiritual wellness and all these things. This is what what a uh, 
uh, a tongue, uh, sorry, um, a gentle tongue is. This is what a gentle speech is. This is what it is to God. It is honoring. It is honoring to one another. It's like being in the garden in the tree of life, dwelling with the Lord. It's a wonderful thing. But harsh words, or it says that the uh, perverseness breaks the spirit. These things are uh, tear us down. We build each other up with compliments and encouragement. We tear each other down with um, these things. I think of my marriage. I think of Lisa and I. When I'm about to do something, okay, whatever it is, it could be the silliest thing, and, and Lisa says some encouraging words to me or you know, is building me up in what I'm doing, I feel like I can take on anything. I will go out and I will run into traffic and stop a car if she says I can. Like, I, I feel like, yes, you know, I, I can take on this day. There's nothing that's going to bring me down. Like, she has enormous power over my life. And I, and I with her, if I'm negative to her, if I am harping on her or putting her down and saying, you, you know, you never do this or you don't, if I'm saying those things to her, she doesn't feel like she can take on anything else because I've brought her down. I've brought her low. Then she goes out into the world and something else happens and something else, like it, it, it is, has a huge effect on her day. Think about the things that we can accomplish when we're a team together. And when we're, we're there to lift each other up, you can do this. You can, you know, that, that kind of encouragement. We have, it's a huge power that we have over one another. A huge power and the effect that we're going to have on other people as we go off to work or go out into the world. Think about the effect that you have on your spouse with the words that you use in their life. You can change the course of their day. I mean, it, it can lead to, to uh, anything a history of encouragement in a, in a man's life can, can lead to an, uh, promotions and, 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 and other things like at work and uh, uh, spiritual things, encouraging each other to, to get out there and, and, and lead a Bible study. You can, you, can, you can preach one day. You can do, you know, encouraging one another. It can lead to all kinds of things. But if we're tearing each other down, we, it's, it holds us back. We don't, we don't go into our, the potential that, that, we can, uh, that we can possibly have. This is true in our life for sure. A couple verses back in 15.1. There's a ton of these uh, verses in here. I'm, I'm going to try not to read them all. There's a couple more. But uh, it says, A soft word turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. We, many of us quote this one all the time, but are we doing it? We, we, we talk about this, Lisa and I talk about this, the cycle of, of conflict, okay? What happens? It only takes one of us to start it. It does, it does take one of us to start it, usually. One of us might be irritable. We might be having a bad day. We might be a little short that day. Something happens, and we lash out of anger, using words, generally, towards the other person, and say something. We know how to get them. It's just a little, little something we're going to say, right? The harsh words come out. It stirs up anger. The other person is now hurt, angry, or in some other place that they're, it's not good. Okay, it stirs up anger in that person. Then what, are they, what happens generally is they return fire with some harsh words, which then stirs up more anger. Well, you were already angry or irritated or whatever, and then you, you fire back, and then you stir up more harsh. So this is a cycle that never ends. It just elevates. This is the fire. This is the little fire that started right here that you then threw into the forest, and it burns the whole thing down because then all of a sudden you haven't talked for three days, and you know, you've had this huge argument. Okay, that's what happens. That's, what, that's, where, that's where conflict goes out of control, where the fire burns everything down when we don't, we're not careful how we speak and treat each other, generally starting with words. A gentle answer, gentle spirit can put out that fire. So somebody might be irritable, somebody might be having a bad day, somebody might be lashing out. We, can, we have a choice in that moment. We can return fire, Literally, fire, start a fire in our house and know that it's going to lead to a bigger fire or we can return with a gentle word. That actually puts the fire out. That actually helps to de-escalate the conflict. So when we have conflict in our marriages, this is a common like cycle that we get into and we have to remember, remember how to handle that. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but expect that there could be conflict in your marriage. Praying together, we were just talking about this, starting your day off in, in, a, in a word of prayer, uh, 
remembering certain things that cause stresses in your marriage, certain times of, of work or, you know, hey, you're going through this thing, whatever it is, and, and be aware of those things, be ready and prepared so that you can, uh, with God's help, <laughs> because we, we already learned that none of us can control this thing on our own, with God's help and with the Spirit of God inside of us, we can actually stop before we lash out in anger, before we say hurtful things to one another. But it's not just that we say hurtful things to one another. It's not that we just use words in our marriages or relationships with people sometimes. This happens outside of our marriages too when our spouse isn't even around. And this can even cause more damage. So let's flip to Romans chapter 1 to talk a little bit about another way that we can use words to... uh, I don't want to say infect, but let's say infect. Infect our marriages. Words that can be used even not to each other that can cause huge problems inside our marriage and outside our marriage. Romans one twenty nine. okay, this is a chapter about God giving people over to their fleshly desires. It's about, uh, he's talking here about his wrath, the section here is titled His Wrath on the Unrighteous, people who've just been given over to their desires. Okay, we're just going to read in the middle of this. I'm not trying to take this out of context. I'll explain. Verse 20, uh, chapter 1, verse 29. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God insolent, haughty, boastful, and it goes on. Right in the middle of all of these awful things that that the people were is this word gossip. This was, this is purely people talking. That's all gossip is. I actually had to look up the definition because I was trying to like think of what is a, what is gossip? What exactly is that? Uh, It says, casual or unconstrained conversation or reports about other people, typically involving details, which are not confirmed as being true. That's pretty good. That's what gossip is. So in our marriages, what does that look like? What happens? We go off to work. We go somewhere. We're out with somebody, and they start talking bad about their husband, start talking bad about their wife. Oh, you wouldn't believe what this they did and what they said and what this. And you, We can get wrapped up in that real quick. Oh, yeah, mine does that too. Oh, yeah, this is, oh, yeah, she did this, he did that, he always does these things, I can't believe that. And that starts to amplify, right? You can get caught up in those conversations real quickly and start to list off all the things. We all have things that we see in our spouses that, you know, oh, I, that we could complain about, I guess, you know? Some people, they want to get people on their team. So that's how those conversations start. You're all going to be exposed to those types of conversations at some point in your life. As a Christ-following husband or wife, it is important that you do not engage in that conversation, that you do not take part in that conversation. It is important that you do not become a gossip of things that are uh, happening at home with your husband or your wife, sharing those things with other people, because you're, you're doing a couple things. Number one, that other person's hearing one side of that story. And after, over time, what's going to happen is they're going to hear this side of the story over and over and over again. And they're going to really come to hate your husband or your wife. They're going to think they're a really awful person. So now you have broken a relationship between two people that maybe never even met each other. That person also is going to take that information that, that is being gossiped about. And they may share that with other people family, friends, their husband, their wife. Oh, did you hear about what he's doing? Did you hear about, oh yeah, she tells me all the time he's doing, yeah, he, you know, uh, he tells me all the time his wife's out doing these things. Oh yeah, she does that. She does this. Now you've created another bunch of people that don't like your wife or your husband because they're all here and know how awful they are. So now you've broken all these relationships and it's a fire that starts to spread. That's what gossip does. And, and, and you know how that story goes. It's going to get worse and worse and worse until all of a sudden, you know, your husband or wife's an axe murderer around town. Everybody thinks they're awful. You know, it's the phone game. That's what happens with gossip. That's what happens when you take part of that. You are not honoring your husband or your wife when you take, and take part in those conversations. You are not honoring God in those conversations. So 
I'm not saying that we can never talk about our husband or wife, but if we do talk about our husband or wife, are we building them up? Are we sharing with, our, with people at work how gr- the, the strengths that they have or the things that they're doing well or right? That's fine to share. I think those things should be shared. I think those things should be commended. But I don't think we should be using negative words in, in a way that's gossip. Um, it can be very poisonous to you. You know, you go home feeling like you got a whole army on your side because they're, uh, you know, you're talk- they all agree. You know, of course, whoever you're talking to, they agree with you. They think you're, you're right and everything. And then you go home feeling like you got an army against your husband or your wife, and it causes more conflict because you feel like, you know, you got it all figured out and you're going to tell them how to, you know, all these kinds of things can happen. Uh, Lisa and I found uh, this, you know, to be very uh, difficult at, at the beginning of our marriage. We, uh, we made this mistake. Let's call mom. Let's call dad. Let's call brother. Let's call sister. We get an argument. Oh, you couldn't, I can't believe yeah, this is going on right now. This happened. She did this. He did that. We all had all kinds of problems going on in our family. People didn't like each other. We're talking bad about them. You know, it's, it's a big mess. Don't get into it. We, we stopped that right away. And that was over for us. Too much, uh, too much trouble. So whether we're talking to our spouse or other people, we need to think about the words that we are using. Positive, encouraging words should be what we are using to build up and, and, uh, and edify our husband or our wife. Even when we are angry, the Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. That is a really great verse because God got angry. We see God get angry in the Bible. It is, we are created in his image and it is an emotion that we all have. No one can say in here that they don't ever get angry. That's not, the Bible doesn't say do not get angry. We are going to get angry sometimes. We are going to get upset. We are going to get hurt. It says, when that happens, that does not give you a free pass to sin against your husband or your wife with your words, with your actions, with whatever it is, but especially with your words. In your anger, do not sin. Stop before the words are said because it's hard to take them back. Once words come out of your mouth, you can't un... I said this, I said this, you can't unremember. It's, it's forget. We can't forget. I don't know why I want to say unremember. It sounds funny. You can't unremember things, okay? You can't forget. You know, I mean, I forget a lot of things, but sometimes the, the, the words that Lisa and I have said, especially early on in our marriage, we had a lot of conflict. The words that are said is very hard. You know, those words come back and, and they, cause, they cause problems. They cause trouble. They cause hurt. They cause, you know, all these things. So, Many years ago, uh, I'll read this to you. Um, many years ago, I ran across this, and I thought that it was, um, it was a fitting example. This is not from the Bible. This is something I just ran across somewhere that I think proves this point. And so it's a little story. Um, it says, there was once a little boy who had a very bad temper. One day, after an angry outburst, his father gave him a bag of nails and told him that every time he lost his temper... He must hammer a nail into the back of the fence. The first day, the boy had driven 37 nails into the fence. Over the next few weeks, as he learned to control his anger, the number of nails hammered daily gradually dwindled down. He discovered it was easier to hold his temper than it was to go and drive those nails into the fence. Finally, the day came when the boy didn't lose his temper at all. He told his father about it. And the father suggested that the boy now pull out one nail for every day that he was able to hold his temper. The days passed and the young boy was finally able to tell his father that all the nails were gone, removed from the fence. The father took his son by the hand and he led him to the fence. And he said, you have done well, my son, but look at the holes in the fence. The fence will never be the same. When you say things in anger, They leave a scar, just like the nails in this fence. You can put a knife in a man and draw it out. It won't matter how many times you say, I'm sorry, the wound is still there. The little boy then understood how powerful his words were. And he looked up at his father and he said, I hope you can forgive me, father, for the holes I put in you. Of course I can, said the father. This is how our sin hurts God. This is how we, we hurt each other. And God looks at us and he, he forgives us. <clears throat> I 
no matter what we've done, no matter how hard we've, we've hurt each other in our marriages, no matter how, hard we have, how much we have hurt God, he sends his son, Jesus Christ, to forgive us, to purify us, to wash us clean from the sin in our life. And we look up and we say, God, I hope you can forgive me for what I've done, and he forgives us. And this is, this is what we have, to, we have to mimic in our marriage we can, we can hurt each other sometimes. We can say some things. We can, we can pick at each other. We can hurt each other. We can, we can get into arguments. We can stir up anger. Things have said, and they do leave a scar. And it takes time to heal sometimes from things like this, the, the, the things that are said. But we have to have forgiveness for each other. We have to mimic the, the forgiveness that the Father offers us. We have to offer that to our spouses freely with no strings attached Ephesians 4, uh, 32, and we'll close uh, here. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, 32. This is, this is the action that I want you guys to take away, okay? This is what I want you to go home with this week. This is what I want you to remember and live out in your life. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And also back up in verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. That it may give grace to those who hear. Let all the words that come out of our mouth be wholesome, be edifying to one another. If there are things that are, that are about to come out, there are thoughts in our head that are about to come out of our mouths that are not edifying, that are not wholesome, that are not gonna build up that other person, maybe it's time we, we put that back inside. We can only do this through the strength of God. We can only do this through the strength of prayer. We can only do this through the strength of our Father, doing that work inside of us. This is what we strive for. I want to quote a couple other verses. First Peter 4.11 says, Whoever speaks as the one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as the one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Ephesians 5, 15. You don't have to turn there if you're already there. I guess we're already close. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We live in a sinful, broken world. We are all sinners. We, are all, we all fall short. We all make mistakes. Like, we all do. Everyone here should understand that. We're all going to fall short. Are we seeking the wise path of following the Lord? Are we, trying, are we fighting the battle against, against anger, against temptation, against these things? We do that by, through prayer together. We do that through reading God's word. We do that through staying close to the Lord and putting into action the things that we learn. That may mean one of these verses that we looked at today, if if this is a struggle that you have, read it every day. It's easy to forget. We need reminders every day to ourselves what it is we're gonna deal with and what we need to do. Are we gonna walk this stuff out? Are we gonna stay close to the Lord? Especially when time is hard, when, when you're going through a hard time in your life, your spouses, whatever it is that you guys are going through in your marriage, I don't know what it is. Be aware that you may have conflict, that you may be angry, that there may be stress, that there may be hurt, and prepare for that. Take care of each other. Remember, you guys are on the same team. Take care of each other. Help each other through. Be there for each other. Let's pray. Dear Lord, 
thankful and blessed, as always, Lord, that you have brought us here together in fellowship and in your word. Your word is so powerful, and your word, the words that you have spoken to us, the words that you have left us, uh, they, they, have, they, they can change a life, Lord. There's so much power in your, in your word, and we know that you have warned us, Lord, of the power that our words have. We ask that you remind us of that every day how we speak to one another, how we treat one another, that it is important, that it it leads to action, that it is meaningful. Father, we ask that you deliver us from the temptation to let every word out. We ask that you deliver us from those things. We ask that you help us to remain focused on your word and your peace and your forgiveness, your grace, Lord, that You offer us so freely that we should offer that freely to one another. I ask that you be with each relationship that is here, those listening online or watching later on, that you would guide each one in their own way, Lord, whatever their struggle is, or maybe somebody in their life that has this struggle, that you would be with them, that you would remind them that their words have power. Lord, be with us as we break into our groups tonight. Be with our conversation. Be with our, us as we go back to our lives uh, later tonight, tomorrow, this week. Be with us, Lord, in spirit and strength. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.